Well, hello everyone. On behalf of Elephant Artist Relief Society, also known as EAR, and the EAR leadership team, I'd like to officially welcome you all to Grant Writing 101 Part 1 for February 2023. Um, my name is Margot Armstrong, also known by, by some of you as Jill, and I'm a longtime EAR board member and part of EAR's programming committee. I apologize, this is the first time I've addressed a group like this with my camera on, but I've had bandwidth issues tonight, so you get to, uh, I'm talking to you through this photo. Anyway, um, I'd like to begin tonight's event in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth by honoring and acknowledging Mokinsis and the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, Kainai, Bigani, as well as the Yasi Nakoda, and the Tsutuna nations, Ear acknowledges that this territory is also cherished by the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3 within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We celebrate all nations, Indigenous and non, who honor this land. We are grateful to engage in an honest process of reconciliation. We are all treaty people. We are grateful for each of you choosing to spend your evening with us this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Our grant writing event this evening is a continuation of a tradition now of resource EAR has offered for over a decade. In the past couple of years, it has been modified a little and is now integrated into our ongoing series of EAR events called Umbrella Talks. We now offer grant writing talks in February and August of each year. This is EAR's first grant writing event for February 2023, and we will be featuring Chris Carson from Carfac Alberta, Carrie McQueen from Alberta Foundation for the Arts, and Taylor Poitras from Calgary Arts Development. Next Wednesday, February 22nd, we will be hosting Michael Peterson from the Canada Council, who will speak about their grant criteria and process. Now, just a little bit more about Elephant Artist Relief Society. Our primary purpose is to empower artists in Calgary and area to survive and thrive as artists. And these umbrella talks are one way we work towards achieving that. This year, we are celebrating Ears Sweet 16. She has been serving the local arts community in Calgary and area since 2007. That year, we started out supporting visual artists only in, and, and then in 2015, we shifted to support supporting artists of all disciplines in Calgary and area. Even though EAR has grown and evolved over that time, our mission has remained the same, to provide practical and emergency resources to help sustain the livelihood and practice of artists of all disciplines in the Calgary area. To achieve this, EAR offers monthly professional and personal development talks such as this one, as well as a twice monthly online artist meetup on Facebook called Studio E. A wide variety of resource information, which you can find on our website, elephantartistrelief.com, and of course, our core program of emergency financial relief for artists who find themselves in a crisis situation. Applications for emergency funds are also available on our website. As a charitable organization, we rely on our funders for our operations, but EAR couldn't provide offerings it, ex it exists to provide without the support we receive through our volunteers, our members beginning and renewing their memberships, and the proceeds from our fundraising events to do much of what we do. Our emergency relief fund is composed entirely of donations and the money from fundraising initiatives. You can help us by raising awareness about EAR, and if you can, consider donating online to help artists in crisis. Our heartfelt thanks goes out to all of those who've already gifted EAR in the past. This year, we're encouraging our supporters to contribute a, a monthly donation of $16 to mark our anniversary. And don't forget, every dollar donated to the emergency fund is allocated to providing relief for artists in times of need. As I mentioned earlier, Another important way you can support EAR is by becoming a member. We offer many perks for our members, including our e-newsletter, 
discounts at a growing list of Calgary-based businesses, uh, voting privileges at our AGM, eligibility to join the Air Board, and access to group health insurance. We have several levels of membership for individuals and organizations found on our website, again, elephantartistrelief.com. And we even offer a $10 yearly membership for students and those whose budgets are a little precarious. While donation cash goes to help artists in need, the money from our memberships goes to support our administration and our programming, including events like the one you're attending right now. So just a few last bits of housekeeping. Throughout the presentation, we ask that you keep your mics on mute and your video off so there's minimal background interference. Please and thank you. Um, please feel free to use the chat box to write your questions as they, as they come up, and we will start a record of those for the Q&A portion of the evening. Uh, tonight's presentations will last in total approximately 60 to 75 minutes, and then we'll take a 10 minute break. At that time, we will provide a link to a feedback form for you to fill out during the break. Please take the time to fill out this form your feedback is extremely important to us and it helps to inform how we move forward. Then we will move on to the Q&A segment, which will take us up to around 9 p.m. So now without further ado, I will pass you along to Carrie McQueen. So enjoy the evening, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Margo. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you guys here. Here we go. And can you guys see my screen okay? Yep, all good, Carrie. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Um, I have about 20 minutes, I believe, so I will be very mindful of the time so that um, there's ample time for both Chris and Taylor after me. I'm Carrie, I'm with the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, and uh, my own background is in visual and media arts, and those are the programs um, that I manage at the AFA. Uh, before I worked here, I actually came from Calgary and worked in the arts nonprofit sector um, for 20 years in the region. So um, primarily visual arts, some dance, a lot of involvement in media arts, centers like M Media, et cetera. Sorry, here we go. Um, to start off, I'll touch, I'm not going to necessarily go through every item on the screen here because I know some of this material will also be covered by the other two presenters. Um, and in the interest of time, you may see that I do skim some things over. I will be providing this um, information to ear after to be shared, or you could reach out to me at the AFA and I'm happy to consult one on one or share this PowerPoint as a PDF with you as well. Um, the Alberta Foundation for the Arts is actually an agency of the government of Alberta. We're not separate from the government, we're part of it. And as that, we're actually responsible to the Ministry of Culture. I forgot to change the name again. We are now just the Ministry of Culture. We are a beneficiary of lottery funds. So if anybody's ever given you a hard time about taxpayers' dollars and your grants, it's not relevant. So you can have great joy in telling them that. The AFA offers a variety of programs. We're most notably known for our grant program. So on screen, you can see a variety of what's on offer. Um, in addition to the individual project grants, which is what I'll be speaking about tonight, we do actually manage four scholarship programs. We also offer grants for organizations and we manage um, the collection of all, our, sorry, our art collection, which is the largest in the world of Alberta art. And linked to that, to that is the Arts Acquisition Program, which is actually not a grant, it's a purchase program. If you are familiar with the Arts Acquisition Program, the deadline has changed to June 1st. It used to be April 1st. And I can speak to that program a little more later. The AFA supports individual artists in all disciplines who are Alberta residents. You can request up to $15,000 for a grant from the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, and they are project-based grants. So this means that what you propose should have a specific start and end date rather than be a regular ongoing activity, which is not eligible. We do have many subcategories listed on the screen here. These are actually subparts of those bigger grants. So if you apply for a visual arts and new media individual project grant, you're asked to check one of those categories. 
Now in visual arts, as we all know, often research same production may be bridging together, marketing and creation may be bridging together. That's okay. You just choose the category that's the best fit. Individual artist grants at the AFA are assessed by an expert panel. Staff like myself don't make decisions about who gets grants. Um, you are gonna need time. If you're new to grants, try to give yourself at least two weeks of time to create and write that grant, go through the editing process and to navigate through the grant system. Um, if you are a non-registered collective or ensemble, you can apply. So what this means is that one individual applies under their name and they kind of take responsibility for that collective or group. And then um, in terms of managing the grant, ensuring that the funds are spent and ensuring that the reporting is done on time. Grants for artists are taxable income in Canada. Um, side note, for those of you that know, AFA does not issue a T4A. Other funders like Cata might, Canada Council does. Um, so that's okay. If you don't get a T4A, always keep your letters that say you get a grant and check stubs from your grant. These are really valuable documents that the CRA accepts as well. And in general, when in doubt, keep records like that for your files. It's really important. The AFA is also have grants that focus on artists at all stages of your career. So we can even have artists who are underage applying, you know, for example, in dance, that's very common. Um, you can be an emerging artist. You can be an artist that had to put your career on hold say for five or 10 years due to having a family or other circumstances and you need to get going again. You can be an artist that's at a really advanced stage of your career with 30 years under your belt. All of those are eligible. Our individual artist grants do not support these things on the screen here. If you're not an Alberta resident, you are not eligible to apply. What this means is that you have to have lived in Alberta for one year prior to the deadline you're applying to. Um, this is really important to note um, that this includes principles in a project where there's a collaborative kind of activity. So if you and another artist are lead artists or principals making creative decisions, and they're from out of province, that will make your project ineligible. Um, however, if you hire people or you contract people to come on board and help you with your project, technicians, supporters, stuff like that, that's okay because you still take creative control of the project. Those individuals are under your direction. That kind of structure is more common in things like film and video or larger scale projects. Um, partial activities are not eligible. So if you are looking to go for post-secondary, AFA is unique in that we do support post-secondary studies, um, i.e. your master's, undergrad, doctorate, but we don't support, say, just the thesis, the, the, sorry, the thesis exhibit or just a couple of courses from that semester. So you're really looking for those kinds of activities to apply per year at the very least with your tuition subsistence and et cetera. That's considered a complete portion of that course of study. Applied arts, gaming, architecture, things that fall under cultural industries are also not eligible because those fall out of the AFA mandate and the government of Alberta does have a cultural industries um, section in our ministry that takes care of all of these things. Ongoing activities I've mentioned, so I won't go into those again. Um, we also don't support business activity, and that's really important to understand that distinction um, within the spectrum of what you do. Many artists straddle from business to personal artistic practice, and there's often areas you can apply to support yourself in terms of developing your own self as an individual as opposed to a business expense. So um, cottage craft industry, commercial enterprise, creating inventory for sale, and that, that's the only reason you're making it, probably not going to be eligible. But if in doubt, reach out to me. I'm there to help you determine, you know, what's eligible, what isn't. I think the rule of thumb with art and artists is that there's always gray areas. So when people reach out to me and they're like, I need help with my grant, and those of you who've seen me before know what's coming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I ask you is, what do you want or need? And this is almost always the answer I get back. Well, is that not obvious? I need money. It costs money to be an artist. It can be expensive. That's a bit of a red herring because the grant is a tool. It is not your goal. The money that you're asking for, the support you're asking for help with is to reach your goals. So your job as that applicant is determine, what are my goals? Do I need to, to do skill development? 
Is it research? Do I need to create work for an exhibit, et cetera? So it is up to you as the applicant to decide what your project is, how it's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen and so forth. AFA does not actually set those parameters. You as an artist does that because you're the expert in knowing what it is you need and what it is that you want to do. First steps in general for granting, not just with AFA, is always read the guidelines. If you reach out to me first and ask questions, chances are the answers you're gonna get are going to be higher level, reflecting exactly what's on our website. It's much more effective if you have a look at the guidelines, take down questions for the things that maybe you're not sure about, then reach out to me and then I can answer questions that are specific to your need and relevant to you. And that's going to be much more useful for you moving forward. We do have an online grant system called GATE. Um, it's recommended that I think it is 10 biz, five business days, you get your account, you make that request if you don't already have one. I encourage you to give yourself at least 10 business days. Um, it, the closer the deadline we get, the busier that we get. So always leave yourself time where possible. Sometimes you can't because you may find out about an opportunity late and that's okay. But when you do have time, make sure you use that so that you're not adding stress to the process that doesn't need to be there. Um, assessment criteria that are outlined in our guidelines are shown here on this page as well. And so that can also tie to you when you're thinking about, is the AFA a fit for me in this grant? Um, are these some of these criteria, do they fit some of my goals? Um, writing your detailed project description. Um, we'll go into some detail on this. Um, sorry, I just realized my slides were out of order and I lost my train of thought. Um, so when you're applying to the AFA, there's three main components to our grants. We have a detailed project description, we have the budget and we have support material. The slide on your screen now speaks to the detailed project description and this is the meat and potatoes of your application. This is your primary tool to show the expert panel, this is the five W's. What am I gonna do? Where is it gonna happen? When is it gonna happen? What are my potential goals or outcomes and so forth? These five W's should also link to your criteria. That speaks to things like your ability to do the project. That's where a timeline in your description is a wonderful thing if your project has, has a longer period, like six or 12 months. That helps the panel to see that you're thinking about how you're going to plan or step your project out. It's a really it's surprisingly more useful than you think. Um, include any resources that you may need, and this can include mentors, materials and supplies, space, training, this is especially important if you're writing an application where you're making a jump in practice. Say you primarily are a painter, now you're moving to glass. Include resources that you have to help you make a transition. This not only speaks to the criteria of your ability to do the project, but it also shows that you're getting the things in place and that yes, the mentor has agreed to support you, for example. So that's how that kind of resource can support your project in general. I think the most important thing that needs to be said about writing grants is there's no magic grant speak, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> so really the, the short of it is write in language that is comfortable for you so that it is clear and it is concise. The panel has to read in the case of the AFA, usually anywhere between 100 and 150 applications in three to four weeks. You want that description to be the tool that says, it's like a work plan. Here's what I'm gonna do. Here's why you need to say yes to me. Here's how it's gonna help me grow as an artist. And then your budget and all of those kind of sections attached to it, tell the details of that project in numbers or in other aspects. Um, COVID contingencies are probably not as relevant now, which is great, but if you have contingencies or unknowns in your project, include those what ifs, those plan Bs. So say you have a large project, you're applying to AFA and Canada Council, but you don't know if you've got either grant yet, always have the plan B in the grant. If I don't get the Canada Council grant, I'll scale my project down in this way so that I can do this project at this scope with AFA funds. And again, that shows that, that you have the ability to do it, that if there's a small change, you're thinking about that and moving ahead. Now for the budget, I'm just gonna hop over here. 
I have up here, and this is actually what a gate application form looks like for those of you who have may, maybe never been in gate. Um, the budget forms may differ and the items that you include in a budget may differ between funders. Um, but for this case, we'll be focusing on AFA. Now you'll notice that this says Indigenous Arts Individual Project Grant. Don't worry about that. It looks identical for the visual arts. So here's a working budget I have to give you a sense of how you can record a budget. There's some important basics about budgets. One is that they need to balance. So if you have $10,000 of expenses that you need to spend your money on, your grant and or revenue needs to also be 10,000. And then some other things that are common questions about budgets. Do I need to itemize, and I'm going into the weeds here. Do I need to like include every single item like this here? Not necessarily. You can do what's called a higher level budget, which is have 20 tubes of paint at this. Now, if you do choose to do higher level budgets without a lot of detail in terms of price per item, say tube of paint, that's where budget notes come in handy. Use your budget notes, no matter what funder you're applying to, to give context. That tells the story of the numbers if you don't have it broken up in really specific detail like that. It's a great tool because it helps the panel understand why you're quoting the numbers that you're quoting. So you can see down here for the AFA materials and supplies or eligible expenses. Um, if you are working with Indigenous or other communities that do have protocols or fees for elders, those are eligible with the AFA. Also fees related to artist fees. Really important note about artist fees in the budgeted AFA. That's actually not for you. That's for people you pay artist fees to because you are not an expense in your budget. So how do you then take care of things like that? How do I make money in this project? How do I pay for my living expenses? That's when you go and you apply for yourself for what is called subsistence. Subsistence is your cost of living. With the AFA, you can apply for up to $3,000 a month and include items like that here. Groceries, childcare, utilities, and so forth. So you don't wanna have an artist fee for yourself for the AFA grant because that's a middleman. We all ask for salaries or, or fees to pay the bills. So for the AFA philosophy, it's just include your bills. Don't be afraid to ask for what you need. You can ask for the full 3000 a month. That is fine. Um, so you can see I have some examples here for research. Could include travel, and these are all made up numbers. These are not real numbers, by the way. Um, and as you scroll down in the gate form, you can see that gate totals that for you when you click save. You have to click save in the system. Now on the revenue side of a budget, um, for AFA, we do have options to have other revenue. You may not have other revenue. You may not, you may not have other grants or donors or even savings and that is okay because not all projects are needing to be supported outside of the grant, or maybe you're just at a point where you don't have that, that does not necessarily reflect poorly on you. Where this comes in, comes in handy and becomes important is if you have a project that is bigger than the AFA grant example. So that's where you need to be considering revenue. If you have a $20,000 project, AFA only gives $15,000, you need to say, hey, I have to actually make this up in revenue on this side, because if you don't, um, number one, gate won't let you submit. You can see it's sewing going, hey, that's too much. Number two, it, do, it may not look like it's feasible to a panel, even if you could get it through, that you could do it. If, if it's a $40,000 project, you've only got 15,000 potentially raised. Um, so that's what that can do for you there. Okay, also in terms of support materials, which is the third portion of our application, um, make sure that you have support materials related to the budget if needed. These could be things like screenshots of quotes, um, quotes you've gotten by email. You may or may not need those quotes. If you don't have quotes, use budget notes. I went on to Expedia to, to get um, fares for flights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I have, I'm going to zoom through some of this because I've kind of already done this. Okay. Ineligible expenses for the AFA includes items like this on the screen here. Most importantly, capital purchases. And, and I like to jokingly say capital purchases are all the things we really want, like computers, you know, a kiln if you're a ceramicist, you know, a Marley floor if you're a dancer, studio renovation, etc. 
um, those are not eligible because they have a life beyond a project and AFA is all about projects. Um, if you're working on an artist book, publication, layout and design is not eligible because that's cultural industries. But just to keep it really muddy, um, <laughs> the things about a book work that aren't eligible are fees for the artist to create the work, writer's fees, editor's fees, maybe you need to document art to get it in the book, um, marketing for the book, so on and so forth. Um, here's some, some examples of support materials, which could include um, images of your work, video or audio, writing samples. If you have a marketing project, maybe you're going to include a marketing plan. That's a very helpful thing. Again, it shows the panel, here's what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it. Um, and you're not going to necessarily have all of these things in your support materials. What you have is relevant to the project that you're doing. Now, after you've submitted your grant, it goes to our expert panel. They get to see those applications through our gate system about three or four weeks before we meet. And they assess each of your applications um, based on the artistic merit and the criteria as shown on the website. And then when they get together and meet, they make that same deliberation in the context of all of those applications together. Um, the assessment, as mentioned, is specific to those guidelines. So when you're writing your grant and you're ever in doubt, go back to how will my application be assessed on the AFA guidelines, because those do not change between what you see on the website and what the panel uses as their filter. We do have different panels for each deadline, so they are never the same. And we also strive to make sure we have panelists um, that represent all Albertans, like regions, age, culture, background, discipline, et cetera, et cetera, um, including um, kind of the status of your career emerging through established. So um, we're always looking for new panelists. If you're interested, reach out to me, um, or you can look at the AFA website under um, funding and adjudication and apply to become a panelist. You can self-nominate. Now, after all of the post process, the board of the AFA does approve all of those decisions. After that, notifications go out to all applicants, whether it's a yes, no, or you're on the waiting list um, in case we have money come up at the end of our year. And the process takes about four months altogether before you get notification. Seems like it is a long time from your side of the table. We're going hard and fast from our side. Our project grants do have final reports. They are always due 60 days after the end of your project. And that date is automatically generated in gate when you enter your project end date. We've actually recently really streamlined our um, report form. So it's something like two questions, five drop downs, the budget update and an attachment to show project completion. So they really do only take 15 to 20 minutes. Keep your receipts in order through a project so that you can refer to them, add them up and put that into your form. And that makes your life a lot easier um, at the end of the day. So to wrap up, um, here's some statistics about the AFA. On average, 25 to 30% of applications are successful per deadline. And that is across all of the different disciplines for the individual project grant. If your grant is unsuccessful, do not, do not let it let it um, do not let the disappointment of that make you feel like your work has not got value or that you don't have value or merit. That is pretty much not the case. Um, the reality is that our budget is limited and that our budget can't cover all of the need that we have in the province. So try again. Always try again. It is quite competitive. And remember, 25 to 30% are successful. Um, learning craftsmanship skills, too, is different than um, your artistic skill set. So keep that in mind. If you're new to grants, the more you do it, the better you get. The same as your artistic practice. The more you do it, the better you get. Um, if you don't get a grant all the time or the first time, um, don't be so hard on yourself in the sense of, oh, I did a horrible job. You may not have done a horrible job at all. And so <laughs> the reality is the grant is not you, is not your art. It's a tool. And it's a tool that we need to learn. And if you're an artist that decides, I don't want to spend time applying for grants, I want to spend my time making art only, that is okay too. There's a lot of artists that do choose to work that way. And uh, there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. It is, does not make you less of an artist if you're not doing grants, as the saying goes. Um, not all grants will be a fit for you either, and that's okay too. And as you move and grow and change through your career, the types of grants you apply to are also probably going to change as well. Um, here on the screen are how many applications we get in each discipline per deadline. 
We have two deadlines a year, March 1st and September 1st. So it's these numbers times two. Um, I believe I, I should have mentioned the um, art acquisition program. That is the purchase program where you can apply to have your art purchased by the AFA and added to our collection. That deadline is once a year, June 1st. And um, I believe they get about 100, 130 applications for that program as well. And I think that's about it. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Oops, and I think I'm supposed to, um, Chris is going next, correct? Correct, absolutely correct. Excellent. So I will now hand it over to Chris Carson of Carfac, Alberta, and um, let me know when you're ready, Chris. Thank you very much, Carrie McQueen. And uh, I just wanted to say I'm Chris Carson. And uh, let's see. Okay, this is just me, but I am broadcasting from Amiskwesiwesigan, which is Beaver Hill House or Edmonton. It's a home of the Cree, Satu, Dakota Sioux, Blackfoot, and the Métis people. And at Carfax, Alberta, we don't really offer any kind of grants. What Carfax, Alberta does is we help artists to do it themselves or to learn what Carrie McQueen said were the grants, writing, grantsmanship skills, and, and things of that nature. So let's see. Um, CARFAC, what is it? It's an organization where it's artists working for artists. And as the founder of CARFAC said, no one is more qualified to speak on behalf of artists than artists themselves. So it's an organization of artists working for artists, kind of like here in a certain kind of way. This is just one of our postcards that just says that in many different languages, artists working for artists. What Carfac is known for is that kind of idea, has the artist been paid? Or that Carfac RAV fee schedule, where if you show your work in a museum or an art gallery where the purpose is for education rather than for sales, you should be paid a certain kind of fee. Uh, the vision of Carfax Alberta is we envision a province where all visual artists thrive, artwork is valued, rights are respected, and creativity is integral to our communities. And how we do this is we do this to what's called we advance best practices through education, advocacy, and engagement. And what we probably say is something like art is an industry and we have standards. And what those standards are, if you go to our website, carfacalberta.com, you could download the seven best practice or industry standards, and therefore all craft media and visual artists of Alberta. And they deal with things like how to work with a commercial gallery, how to work with a public gallery, how to organize a juried exhibition, what do you do if you're dealing with fundraisers, the importance of things like contracts, which are vital to everything. Uh, so I would suggest if you're not familiar with these, please check them out. Okay, tonight I'm just going to, as I say, we're doing the kind of background thing where you have to make a decision. We're teaching you to do it yourself. So you're kind of having to make a decision on whether grants are right for you and if that's an opportunity you should be pursuing. So we're gonna look at what is a grant? Should I apply for grant funding? Where, when, and why? Are there opportunities like grants? a few just basic tips of how to write a grant and the benefits of writing a grant. So what are grants? Carrie kind of mentioned a bit about what grants are for the AFA, but uh, it's a grant is something that does not have to be repaid. So it's not really a donation, but it is when government businesses or something 
gives you something for a specific purpose. So there's always a specific purpose in mind. And it's one of the government's tools to, well, to stimulate the economy. And that's some of the ways that, that it is important. So there is a reason why the government actually does these things. The granting process, it follows a certain kind of life cycle, and that is you apply. There's some decisions that are made by the organizations, and then the projects have to be successfully implemented. So this is called you know, a pre-award phase funding opportunities and the application review, which Carrie kind of really went into what those kind of look like. So when you're thinking about grants, like do I apply for one? You have to think about you and your art career. So you have to kind of know what you do, know what you want. You have to know who you are. And then you have to decide, is this grant or this opportunity the right fit for me? So when we're trying to write some kind of grant proposal, and this is just general sorts of ways, um, we begin with, we have to have some kind of need statement or some need. You know, uh, we have to want something, otherwise we wouldn't be applying for a grant. And what we do when we're writing a grant, we have to support this need statement with evidence. And this would be kind of digital slides, photographs, maybe letters from people in the community. Uh, so we're supporting, we're providing evidence. And then we also use language and a format that is easy to read and to be understood. So when we're thinking about all these sorts of things, a goal without a plan is this a wish. And that we have to do more than just wish for something. And so we have to think about what is a plan when we're developing a plan? And a plan doesn't have to be fully written out. It might be just written on napkins, sometimes, we form a plan when we're applying for some kind of show or exhibition or a residency, and then it develops into that we need money for to fulfill a project. Sometimes we develop a plan in our diary or a sketchbook. Sometimes the plan is what we develop on New Year's Eve when we say, in this next year, I want to do the following things, and then we discover how we're going to do them. So the thing to remember always is a grant is like a business plan. It's something that you are doing for the future. You're probably not going to hear back from a granting agency for three months, sometimes to six months. Carrie said the AFA probably is around four months. So if you're writing a grant, you really are making a certain kind of business plan and you're planning your art career. And as success rates vary, you always should have a plan B in case you do not achieve funding for your grant proposal the first time. So you might say, well, if I don't do this, maybe I have to adjust my planning or find other ways to make this proposal still work. Maybe it'll be a smaller way. Maybe it won't be, uh, I won't be able to do something in two months, but maybe I'll do it over a year period. Okay. Have a, do you have a plan? Do you have a Plan A might be to get a grant. Plan B might be something slightly different. Maybe you need a plan C as well. So the question becomes, should I apply? So here, you really have to begin to answer the questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Start with why. Uh, you have to 
one of the first questions worth asking is, is why? Why am I doing this? Uh, you know, there's a kind of rational way. Uh, why is the project going to be a good investment for you? Why is this project going to be a good investment for the granting agency? So you have to think of why. Why are you seeking funding for this project? You really have to know some of these things before you even start. Um, and the other why is something called the opportunity cost. It takes a lot of time to write a grant. It's, you know, you're not going to do this overnight. It's not going to be something that you do in two hours. So um, how much time do I have to spend to, to write this grant? What are my chances for success? Um, are you well enough prepared to write this grant right now? Do you have a really clear and concise idea of what you're going to do? and what you want to do. Um, you know, as you're writing the grant, if you're just writing down things, you're actually learning so much about yourself. So it, it's kind of, uh, it does do something for you. Even if you do not achieve a grant, you might learn something about yourself and why you're making art, just as we go through this time-consuming process of, uh, of writing this. Okay, so the other thing to remember is that there are grants. I mean, Carrie talked about what the AFA offered, but also remember that there are other opportunities out there and some things that are out there are never advertised. And I mean, you have to think about other things that might be happening with community groups, nonprofit associations, universities and colleges. Uh, business associations. Some of these things, maybe you can get money for a project, but it might be a more informal way of getting money by, by going to places that might not have something advertised, but you might have a project that is in line with another nonprofit organization. So you can work together to do something. So I'm just saying there's, there's ways around it, okay? Now, Carrie was talking about the AFA. Taylor is going to be talking about Calgary Arts Development. And I think next week you are going to, there's an opportunity to learn about the Canada Council. So some of them that they offer are the Explore and Create grants. And the one thing that we say about Canada Council is Albertan artists do not get their fair share of money from the Canada Council. So, so think about applying for the Canada Council, but the important thing you have to remember is you need to be vetted first. You have to apply on a portal at least 30 days before you want to apply. So if you're applying for the grants now, I think there's some for May the 1st or something, you better be starting right now. Okay. Uh, we always get the question asked, you know, where do you kind of find information? And here, you know, some of the things you can ask your friends, you join clubs and art organizations, you take a class, you, you attend sessions like this, this uh, professional development session offered by ear. You use the resources at your library, use the internet. Remember, as you're doing these things, you are going to be doing it yourself or DIY. Okay, so when you're writing a grant, you have to determine in your requirements. You have to ensure that you have all these acceptable, well, you have all the qualifications necessarily to apply. You can make use of cordial connections by asking people who have had grants before how they do it. Sometimes it, another thing you could do is review some previous grant recipients what they did so you kind of know who is getting these kinds of grants. Another thing to do is get trained professionally by taking courses like this or by getting mentorship from organizations or community or, or senior artists in your community to say, how do you really write a grant? You have to always remember to keep it organized. Set realistic goals for yourself. 
at Carrie mentioned this, make it budget friendly, really have a balanced budget, have a budget that's easy to read. Another thing to think about when you're writing grants, put yourself in the shoes of the of who's the granting agency and ask yourself, would if you were the granting agency, would you be interested in a project that you're suggesting? And really mention some of your strengths and not your weaknesses. Okay. So where do we get knowledge from? And it again is from places like Air Calgary Arts Development, Edmonton Arts Council, the AFA, Carfac, Akimbo. Now we're just going to briefly go into how to write a grant. So just some a few quick tips. Okay. So these are tips, tricks, and discussions on writing a winning grant proposal. So these are kind of mentioned before. Some things that you have to really think about is you want your grant proposal to be really clear. So clarity and honesty. And clarity, you can learn from others. You can get somebody, a senior artist in your community. Uh, you know, uh, even I read grants and something like that. I can improve your clarity and say this, you are really being clear. Now, honesty is something that you have to learn on your own and you have to believe in. So clarity, you can learn from others. You can take a, a class to learn clarity, but honesty, it's very important and that you have to learn on your own. So you have to think about, when you're thinking about clarity, it's, does your proposal make sense? And the budget, do the figures add up? And or what you're putting down for paint, really what people would pay for paint. Because remember, this is an expert panels that are usually reviewing it and they know how much things cost. So, you know, you have to make sure that the budget makes sense. And clarity also means, did you answer all the questions like who, what, when, where, how, and why? This is from another granting agency. This is from the Edmonton Arts Council. And it would be the way, you know, kind of one of those need statement could be written, okay? My name is, I have been practicing art for this amount of time. I am requesting $15,000 from, say, the Alberta Foundation from the art. My intent is to, uh, you know, develop a, a, a series of painting over the next six months. The bulk of the $15,000 will go to my subsistence and to pay for art supplies. And the goal of this is that I'm going to learn so much about myself and, and have a series of work that I can start applying to shows for. So you have to hear in one, kind of boring sentence, I answered the questions of who, what, when, where, how, and why. So people kind of know when they start reading it, what it's about. So I've been on some juries and there's so many people who don't really deal with in their introductions, don't even say who is applying. They don't say what they want to do, where you're going to do it, where did you come from? How are you going to do it? Why do you want to do it? And without this information, for somebody who's been on jury, I get very confused. So that's why you really have to think about making sure you have this, some kind of statement or the beginning of it where you are actually answering all these questions. Now, it's always vitally important to have a couple of people read your proposal. Does it make sense to them? Sometimes we get somebody who even doesn't know anything about our art practice. Does it make sense to them? Can they understand it? Is it written in language that they can understand? Um, and another question that really you have to ask yourself, does your proposal address what is asked in the guidelines for the grant? read the guidelines once, read the guidelines twice, uh, 
actually, sometimes I actually put the guidelines right into what I'm writing and making sure I answer it, and then I just cross out the, the question that they have. So clarity, make sure that your project have measurable goals that can be, that people can really see. Make sure that you answer concisely. So you're directly answering every question that is put forward. And make sure that your arguments are a bit compelling. And this goes back to storytelling. Um, your proposal should be written in a manner that the reviewer wants to move forward with your idea. That's very important. So clarity, concise, and compelling. That, that pretty well helps you. Um, and as I say, read the grant guidelines at least twice. Make sure you understand them. If you don't understand, reach out to the grant agency or an individual in your community, somebody who's done a grant before, and see if they can help you explain what they really are looking for. Remember, grants are for the future. You're not likely to hear back for three months or more. So have a plan B, okay? Start early. You can always start in spring for a proposal that's due in the fall. Leave, your time, leave yourself times to write and rewrite. Leave yourself time to have others read what you have written. And as you rewrite, you begin to clarify your thoughts. You begin to learn more about yourself, what you want out of life, and you learn more about your art. You begin to clarify your thoughts. Okay, honesty, and honesty is just, just what we said before, artists working for artists. No one can tell your story better than you yourself can. Honesty is your voice, your thoughts, all about you. Honesty is you doing you. Honesty involves being aware of who you are, what you want, what you need, and where you are in your art career. You have to think about certain kinds of grants. Who was awarded them before? You know, in, in some cases you get people who are emerging artists and want to be nominated for awards that go to senior artists. You have to really be honest with yourself and say, if I'm an emerging artist, I should probably go for grants that emerging artists get. And really just really be aware. You have to do your research and find out who is getting and why. So do your research, be aware of what every grant opportunity is for. And remember, not every opportunity is suited for everybody. Who is the intended audience for an opportunity? Ask yourself honestly, are you a good fit for this opportunity? And you would save yourself a lot of time if you can be honest with yourself before you go to the trouble of applying. Always remember to answer who, what, where, when, why, and how. And benefits of writing a grant, as Carrie said, it's not really the money, is getting a grant is like getting another part-time job or another gig. You are doing a lot of work. So benefit is, it's like a job, benefit of grant, is you have the time to do things. The benefit of a grant is that you make things happen and you can make things happen that you want to have happen. And remember, if you fail to plan, you really are planning to fail. So remember to answer those questions. Remember to do your research. I'd like to just thank you. Uh, if you want a copy of this PDF, just write the nice people at Ear. They have a copy of these uh, images now, so uh, you can read them and go through them. I am really just going to stop sharing right now.
And boy, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our next speaker, and that's Taylor Portress from Calgary Arts Development Agency. Welcome, Taylor. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Uh, I love going last because it just lets me know what I should not repeat. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Pull up my PowerPoint here. All right. Uh, can everyone see my slide? Yeah, no problem, Taylor. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I know a few folks have been asking in the chat, uh, I will also share a PDF version of my slides, as well as um, I usually have like a list of uh, CADA resources. So if I'm mentioning things like um, the different program links or the FAQ or um, where to nominate yourself to be an assessor, I'll send links to all of those kinds of things as well. So they're easy to find for you. All right. There we go. Um, so for those of you on the call today who might not be familiar with CADA, um, that's the acronym. We're called Calgary Arts Development Authority. The A is pretty silent on the end there. Um, we're the city's designated arts development and municipal granting organization in Calgary. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to change my view here because I have the videos are blocking my notes here. There we go. Okay. Um, CADA is mandated to steward public taxpayer dollars for the public good, so for the benefit of all Calgarians. Uh, we believe in fostering a sustainable and resilient arts sector, which we do primarily through making grants to individual artists, to artist collectives, and nonprofit arts organizations here in Mokinsis. Um, so this is just a very high level overview of some of the other departments and resources um, that CADA offers. Uh, I'll send links to all of these with a little description of each one, but we have free classified ads, event listings, an artist directory, a regular newsletter, which is really great to sign up for to stay in the loop on anything CADA related or community related. Um, we have research and publications. Uh, we do lots of other things around events and awards, living a creative life. And then we have a new public art team, um, which we took over from the city of Calgary. So it's kind of in a transition period, but um, there's a whole team who has other types of grants and programs related to public art. Um, so I'm happy to connect you with that team as well. Uh, today, I'll focus on the community investment team, um, which is the department at CADA that's responsible for creating and running our grant programs. Um, so that makes up more than 75% of our total annual budget that we receive from the City of Calgary. And that's a separate budget um, from what is offered to, uh, by the public art team. So beyond running the process, our team is really here to help direct you um, to any other potential resources or supports. Um, and of course, if you do decide to apply to a grant, we're here to help you uh, fairly access and navigate the programs, um, which can include providing accommodations. Um, and really, my job is to help every artist applying uh, tell their story in an authentic and clear way. Uh, you're the experts in your artistic practice and what you want to do, uh, and we're supposed to be the experts in the programs that we offer. So well, that's my main job is to support y'all. Uh, this is just a quick overview of the team, which has grown in the last two years, which is awesome, <laughs> very exciting. Um, we have a new manager, Alan Rosales. Melissa's been at CADA forever. Now she's our director. And we have a couple new program specialists who've joined us last year, Perpetua Latife and Morgan Postberg. Um, March has been around for a while. They run the arts organizations programs. So we all um, uh, work as a team. Van Chu is probably someone that most of you will interact with. They're the grants coordinator. Um, and they do a lot of that you know, initial interface thing. So if you ever email the grants at calgaryartsdolan.com email, Van is the one responding to those or triaging you to whoever you need to talk to. All right. Um, so before we dive into the actual grant programs, uh, it's really important, I think, to acknowledge that systems like granting and public funding are really often designed in a one size fits all way, which means that they're designed for the dominant culture and they're rooted in colonial Western European academic systems, which creates barriers to access for many, many artists and groups in our um, in our community. Uh, who are seeking and deserving of support. So one really obvious example of this is that uh, CADA's grant programs, like many others, are offered typically online, uh, written, 
and in English. And so that alone creates a lot of barriers to access, technological barriers, linguistic, uh, cultural barriers, just to name a few. And so as a public funder, we have a responsibility to provide equitable access to public funding. Um, and so to that end, CADA is really committed to uh, addressing and working to eliminate institutional inequity uh, in our programs, our policies, and our practices. Uh, our staff, including myself, are accountable to ensuring that lines of communication are welcoming, clear, and open, and that our application and assessment processes are fair and deeply considerate. Um, so while we have been, you know, continually working on expanding and improving these different policies and programs and processes, um, particularly around uh, equity, anti-racism, accessibility, and accommodation, uh, it is an ongoing journey, one that will probably never end. And so we want to continue building relationships with folks in the community, learning from our community, um, especially those who are most directly affected um, about the challenges that exist in public funding and working to create more equitable systems. So if you ever want to chat about that, uh, my inbox is always there and I'm, I'd love to have a coffee with anyone. So in recognition of some of the barriers that I mentioned, we work one-on-one -on -one with applicants to develop accommodations or different approaches that might suit uh, their unique abilities or situations. So some examples are translation of material, including ASL, uh, transcription of verbal meetings into um, or audio and uh, video recordings into a written document, uh, language interpretation for phone or video meetings, uh, verbal or audio applications. So this means that if you would prefer to apply um, and answer questions verbally, you can always submit an audio or video recording of yourself or our staff can help you um, produce that and put that together using online tools and platforms. Um, oh, I already said that one. Grant writing assistance. Um, so I'll touch a little bit more on that in the next slide. Um, but in, in addition to all of these accommodations, our program staff are usually able to provide feedback on your application before you submit. So just remember to reach out to us early with any questions or draft applications, um, preferably 10 days or more in advance of a deadline. We'll always do our best to get back to you, but for full feedback, uh, more time, the better. It gives you a chance to uh, well, us a chance to respond and you a chance to absorb that and maybe make some changes to your to your application. We also sometimes offer feedback after uh, you apply to a program, whether you're successful or not. And that feedback comes more from an assessment committee perspective, which can be really valuable as well. It's not just a staff perspective, but it's you get to hear um, what kinds of things came up when the committee was reviewing your application. Um, so yeah, we want to recognize that uh, the limitations of some of our staff um, to adequately support all needs in the community. Uh, for an example, I only speak English, so I would not be very helpful or uh, good at supporting someone who might need some translation services. So we have also begun to formalize uh, a more formal process for, for folks to request financial assistance to help alleviate some of the costs that might be associated with preparing and submitting a grant application or submitting a final report or receiving an investment. So like reading over a document um, or like a, an agreement before you uh, accept a grant. So individuals who self-identify as uh, being deaf or hard of hearing, having a disability or living with mental illness, or an artist who might face uh, uh, language, geographic or cultural um, barriers can request this kind of assistance. All you have to do is email us um, and uh, basically to request assistance, we can provide suggestions for some service providers. Um, but for the most part, it's really up to you to, to find somebody who you trust that could be a good support for you. So it could be a friend, a family member, an artistic peer, um, or an actual professional service provider, um, and we'll pay them directly for, um, for supporting you in any part of the application process. Um, we pay them directly so they can invoice us, and we have sort of a policy that outlines the maximum amounts that we're able to offer for different programs and different kinds of support. Um, so I can go over that with anyone in more detail. Um, just send me an email. All right, so what is a grant? I know this was kind of covered, but basically a grant is a sum of money that's awarded um, by CADA in this case to artists or organizations to help them pursue their creative vision or to operate or to complete a particular project or share their work um, with the public. And that can be locally, nationally, or internationally. And unlike a loan, grants don't need to be repaid. Um, it's an investment in you. Um, the only thing we usually require is something like a follow-up report um, in exchange for that investment. So a final report is typically submitted online and includes an update of what actually happened, um, how you were impacted, and then a budget with actuals. 
So CADA offers various granting programs each year. Some of them are really specifically intended to support nonprofit arts organizations in Calgary or Mokinsis, and others are really specific to individual artists and artist collectives. Some grants offer year-over-year -year funding, like an operational grant for an organization, and most grants are one-time grants that offer um, support for a specific project, activity, or outcome, so something like a project grant. Uh, funders may have programs that are really specific to, you know, a type of activity like grants for travel or grants for creation, grants for professional developments. Um, some grants might only be available to specific communities or disciplines. So there might be a program that's specifically um, to support Indigenous communities or music specific uh, grants, things like that. Um, they might also be context specific or have like a goal in mind. So we've had COVID specific relief funding that we've offered in the past, or um, there might be some sort of uh, focus like um, projects that address uh, climate change or um, projects or initiatives around truth and reconciliation, things like that. So always pay attention to what the goal of the program is. And that's kind of the point is every grant program uh, can vary a lot in terms of eligibility, goal, timeline, the amount you can ask for, um, all of those things. So it's really important to pay attention and do your research um, before you apply to any grant. Our programs uh, can vary year to year based on things like our annual budget from the city, um, program evaluation, community feedback. Uh, the current context of the art sector and many other factors. So always check uh, what's available each year. CADA runs on a calendar year cycle. So our programs are typically announced at the beginning of the year, sometime in January. Um, and full guidelines, which have more detail about each program, those sometimes come out closer to whenever that program is opening to the public. Uh, you can always find a list of all of our programs on our website under the investment program tab. And I'll send a link. Um, eligibility. So this can vary from program to program, but for CADA's individual and collective programs, which I'm focusing on today, um, these are generally true across all of them. So our individual and collective programs are intended um, to provide one-time funding to professional individual artists or artist collectives. Um, uh, artists need to be uh, based in Calgary, Mokinsis, or um, be able to demonstrate that they have a clear relationship and connection to the Calgary community. So some folks live outside of the, you know, the city uh, limits or borders technically, but they still have a relationship and um, may still be eligible to access funding. So um, we support artists working at any stage of practice uh, in any artistic discipline. Um, so I'll take a moment to kind of clarify some of these uh, pieces a bit more. Um, so while activities don't have to take place in Calgary, applicants must be Calgary based or like I said, uh, able to demonstrate that, you know, their work is available to the citizens of Calgary and they have a relationship with the city and its artistic communities. Um, when I say all disciplines, I really pretty much mean all disciplines that that list is ever growing and expanding circus arts, craft arts, community and social practice, curation, dance, deaf arts, digital arts, disability arts, film, indigenous arts, literature, media art, multidisciplinary practices, music and sound, performance, theater, and visual. And there's probably more that I didn't list. Um, we don't have standard definitions for emerging, mid-career, or established artists. Uh, those definitions can be very different based on artistic discipline or type of practice and individual experience. So our programs are really open to any um, professional artist at any stage of practice. And so what do we consider to be a professional artist? We consider that to be someone who's actively pursuing a career in the arts and who has invested in the development of their skills, voice, and goals. So you may have formal training, but you can also have informal training or be self-taught. Um, we value all ways of knowing and learning and developing a practice. Um, professional artists have usually shared their work in some kind of public way where they're actively striving to share their work publicly and be compensated for their work. Um, professional artists usually have a relationship with their artistic communities and peers. Uh, and knowing, you know, if you're new to the city, those might still be very, very much in development. Um, and artists don't necessarily have to be working professionally in the arts full time. Um, we know that's not always possible. So you can have other, other hats and jobs, of course. Um, a collective is basically two or more individual artists who work together in, a, in an ongoing way, um, who have sort of a shared artistic practice that is distinct from their own. 50% um, of the collective should be Calgary based. 
and new, kind of new-ish this year, maybe more formalized, um, we are also open to considering applications from cultural workers, um, as long as they're the lead artist for the creative process and holding that artistic vision. So the application should really be focused on their own artistic practice, vision, and goals. And I know cultural work, work is kind of a vague term. So when I say that for, for CADA purposes, that typically refers to individuals who make their living in the arts and culture sector and contribute to the success of, you know, other artists or organizations work in a creative or technical capacity. But quite often they're not leading, they're not necessarily leading the artistic vision of the work being created. Um, so that can include folks like um, production team members. So if you're a costume designer or cutter, a uh, sound designer or operator, a lighting designer, a set designer, a technician, an editor, a colorist, all of those kinds of roles typically haven't been eligible to apply to CADA programs, but we are making exceptions if, you know, if the application is really focused on uh, your development, your vision, your goals, your practice. And of course, there can be, you know, other um, impacts for the community as well. So there's full definitions and a lot more detail about all of those in our guidelines and in our FAQ. So definitely check those out and reach out if you have questions. Um, our individual and collective programs are not able to support applications from arts administrators, registered for-profit corporations or businesses, um, or nonprofit organizations. Uh, they're separate programs for um, nonprofit arts organizations. Um, and I just want to add some clarity too. Um, if you're an individual artist who is kind of registered as a sole proprietor and your business is you and your art practice, that's okay. What we're really referring to is, you know, we can't uh, we can't fund incorporated businesses, especially if it's at the level of, you know, you have employees and shareholders and the main, you know, purpose for existing is to make profit. <laughs> so that's sort of the distinction there, but we're happy to chat if you have um, questions. Uh, the last two points here, you need to be in good standing, which basically just means you don't have any overdue late final reports. Um, so if you haven't filled out a report and we've been waiting for it and you haven't really gotten an extension or communicated with us, then we might not allow you to apply to another program until we figure that out. And then there's a new rule that started this year um, that you may not have more than four open grants with CADA. And that includes grants for which you did maybe get an extension for. We just don't want you to have four open projects and activities that are ongoing and, and still applying for more. So as long as you can wrap up a couple of your other grants, then you can continue to apply. Okay. So this year we have two, two primary programs which I'm going to talk about. This first one here is the Artist Development Microgrant. Um, this was available last year, but there's been a couple changes. So definitely read the current guidelines once they're available. Uh, they go up on the site February 21st, so very soon. Uh, the goal of this program is to contribute to the skills and knowledge required to advance artist careers and develop practices in Calgary. So this program has two streams. It's really looking to support professional and artistic skill development activities and business and career development activities. So I'll give a little bit more uh, of an idea of each of those. So the first stream, um, professional and artistic skill development, this stream is really for activities related to the professional development of your artistic practice, skills, knowledge, relationships, etc. Um, so that could be through continuing uh, education, training, learning or development opportunities. Um, it can in involve uh, earning or maintaining certain credentials. Um, activities can be self-directed or non-self-directed, and they can take place online or in person locally, nationally, or internationally. So there's a list of examples there um, of some common PD activities. So apprenticeships, artistic training or mentorship, courses, classes, workshops, internships, uh, maybe an invited opportunity. You've been invited to perform at a conference or speak at a conference, um, or you want to attend a residency. Uh, there is a caveat here that we cannot support um, activities or costs associated with uh, degree granting programs. So we can't fund you to go to back to school and get a degree or a diploma, but continuing ed courses and, and one-off classes are okay. Okay. Uh, the second stream is more around business and career development activities. So this stream is for activities related to the development of the business side of your artistic practice. So this is a little bit different than AFA and something that's kind of new for Kata to really be talking about so directly. <laughs> um, but this can involve activities or opportunity related to better documenting, marketing, promoting, or sharing your work. 
learning or developing specific business skills or models, developing or expanding your networks, markets, or revenue streams, and activities can be, again, self-directed or non-self-directed and take place anywhere. Um, so some examples, I know this is like a hefty slide, I couldn't really summarize it very well, <laughs> um, but it could include business and training development, so courses, mentorships, workshops, maybe more centered on finance or accounting or legal. I know artists are always wanting to create solid contracts and have a lawyer look at those, like that could be an activity. Um, development of business plans, models, or strategies for your art practice, documentation of works that have already been completed. So maybe creating a portfolio, getting your work professionally um, photographed or creating a video for your work to be marketed. Um, it can include things like website development, uh, content or strategy creation, publicity, media tours, interviews, attending conferences, showcases, networking events, etc. So lots of examples uh, just to give you an idea. It's one-time funding. Uh, you can apply with one activity or opportunity. All of the eligibility pieces are kind of the same as what I already mentioned. Um, with this program, uh, you can apply as either an individual artist or as a collective in the year. You can't apply as both. We kind of ask you to prioritize it for this program. Um, and you can only receive one micro grant per calendar year. So while it does have two deadlines, if you're successful in the first intake, you can't apply again for the second one. You'd have to wait till next year. Um, so yeah, this is a bit of an overview. So it's a micro grant. Uh, you can apply for up to 5,000 towards your activity or your opportunity. We have $450,000 available this year. So there's two deadlines. So we split that pool into two. So 225,000 per intake. Um, the first deadline is April 5th, 4.30 p.m. Notifications will be shared within eight weeks uh, of that deadline. So in late May for the first intake and funds will be distributed throughout June. So just to give you a sense, uh, the second deadline is in the fall, September 13th. Notifications again in eight weeks, so probably by mid-November, and funding follows in November, December. Uh, activities funded through this program can begin before the deadline, but they cannot be fully complete before the deadline. So in take one, if you had something that was being uh, undertaken uh, say in March, and it was going to be completed before April 5th, it would not be eligible. But if you were doing something that was going to be completed sometime later in April or May, June, July, then that's okay. Um, activities in intake one do need to be wrapped up by the end of this year, so December 31st, 2023. For deadline two, same rule applies, um, but uh, activities need to be complete by June 30th, 2024. So it's just over six months kind of from when you find out that you got the grant that you have to wrap things up. Um, I'm not going to go into the very the details of these programs, like in terms of the criteria or the scoring, read the guidelines and take a look at those. Those are definitely the most important parts to pay attention to, to know how your grant will be assessed and how decisions will be made. Okay. Oh, did I skip one? No. Um, so this is the project grants. Uh, this runs every year. It provides one-time project funding to individuals and collectives. Again, any discipline, any practice. Um, applicants may apply to this program for one project or a distinct phase of a larger project. So sometimes you need to phase things out if it's a really long-term or expensive um, project. Like I think about film, it might just be for pre-production and production. Um, individual artists can request up to 15,000 and collectives can request up to 20,000. Um, you may apply as an individual and as a collective to this program. So unlike the micro grant, you could ostensibly have two applications submitted, one as an individual for a project and be a part of a collective as well for another project. They just have to be completely separate and distinct projects. And again, you can, um, oh yeah, there's only one deadline. So yeah, you'd only get one a year max. Um, and a project, so any specific project can only get one CADA grant regardless of calendar year. I'm a little bit, don't know if I skipped a slide. Oh, I might have deleted the slide that kind of gives an overview of the um, the amounts for the project grant, but there's 2 million available and you can request, like I said, up to 15 or up to 20,000 depending. So there's two streams for this program. 
There's the create and develop stream, which is uh, looking to support the creation and development of artistic work. So that can include research, creation, experimentation, production, learning and development, et cetera. So it's the kind of activity that's not necessarily going to involve sharing this with, a, with the, an audience or the public at this time. Maybe eventually it will be shared, but this is really around the creation and development phase of the work. Uh, the second stream is program and present. So this is for the actual sharing of artistic work and can include things like exhibition, presentations, performances, releases, touring, marketing, et cetera. Um, so in, in uh, projects through this stream, there is an element of sharing the work publicly or presenting it to an audience. It can also include the creation aspect all the way up to presenting it. Um, so yeah, those are the two program streams. Oh, here we go. There's the I knew I made a slide. Um, so this project grant opens mid-March. The deadline to apply is May 10th, 4.30 p.m. Notifications will be out by early August. So that's a little bit of a quicker turnaround time than some other grant programs, but it's, it's, it makes me nervous, but hopefully we can get everyone uh, their results by early August and then you would get funding in the, the weeks to come to follow. Um, activities funded must be complete by December 31st, 2024. So you have over a full year um, to wrap up activities. There are also three programs available specifically to support projects and activities from First Nation, Métis, and Inuit artists. Um, so Morgan Posberg, who I mentioned earlier, runs these programs. Uh, there's information and guidelines on the website for all of these. OPIP is like a project grant, and the deadline for that one is October 4th. The other two, Honoring the Children Grant and Indigenous Artists Micro Grant, don't have a deadline. So applications are ongoing until the funds are allocated. So if you know folks who might be interested in these programs, or if you might be eligible, you can reach out to Morgan for more information. I can never talk in under half an hour, so I'll send these slides <laughs> so you can read them more fully. Um, our grants are peer assessed as well. We have multidisciplinary committees. We pay an honorarium to anyone who serves on a committee and they change program to program and year to year as well. Um, we accept nominations anytime. There's a form on the website for public art and uh, community investment grants, but you can also just send an email and say, hey, I'm interested in assessing and I'll add you. Um, so yeah, I think they covered these things really well. Um, before you apply to a grant, really just consider where you're at in your practice and what your goals are. Um, you know, what's the most urgent, relevant thing to you? What are you, what's feasible for you at this time? What, what exists in terms of opportunity? And make sure to read guidelines and FAQs, um, pay attention to the program uh, goals and criteria, and ask questions and talk to people like us early. Um, we're here to support you, so don't be shy. Uh, we do accept applications online through a, a grant portal. Um, it's a brand new one we started using last year. Uh, I think it's better in a lot of ways, but definitely on our end, it's a little bit tougher <laughs> to program, but um, there's a profile. You can you can create your account if you don't already have one anytime. Uh, it's very straightforward and easy to do, and you can start to fill out the profile info, which is things like your resume or your artistic practice statement. And then once applications open, when programs open, you can then start an application, work on it, save it, come back to it until you're ready to submit. But that'll ask for project-specific uh, information. So description, budget, timeline, support material. Um, artist statements. Yeah, this is something that we, we often get questions about. Um, in a nutshell, this is really an introduction to who you are as an artist and your overall practice and goals. So it's not about the project specifically or the, you know, the opportunity you're applying for. It's really about you as a as an artist. What do you what do you make? What do you do? Um, what's important to you? What inspires you? How do you make it? You can talk about your process or your approach. Um, and it's really kind of the first thing that assessors read to understand who whose application they're assessing and uh, what matters to you. And then they can really clearly see how the project you're applying for connects to your practice and your overall goals. Resumes and CVs, um, usually you have to uh, include one of these with grant applications. It's basically a list of experiences that are relevant to your art practice. Um, keep it simple, make it easy to read. There's tons of examples online from artists in different disciplines. Um, only include relevant things, try to uh, include the dates and locations um, so that it's easy to kind of see the history of your practice uh, and your, your experience. I'm really glossing over, so sorry. <laughs> um, budgets, 
include everything, the full scope of the project, all expenses and any revenues. Um, don't work backwards from the request amount. So if you know you can request 15,000 max, don't try to fit your project into that. Add up what you actually need to do your project. And then you can see if it falls under 15, if it's close to that max, if it goes above 15, then do you need to scale down, find other revenue sources. Um, and that, that's the best way to go so you're not hamstringing yourself. Um, use notes. More detail, the better with budgets. Uh, really explain what each item is, how you calculated or estimated it, what's it, what's it based on. Um, yeah, more detail is always great. And support material is often optional, but it's very highly recommended. So please, please view it as being, I think, something you need to include. Um, you can use support material to back up, you know, your your work, examples of your work. Um, you can it can demonstrate the capacity for you to do certain work, uh, maybe past projects that were similar that you've been able to to undertake. It can help demonstrate research and planning, um, relationships and partnerships. So if you have letters of confirmation or support that are relevant to the project, those can be really beneficial. Um, yeah, and just be really succinct and specific with what you include, only include what's relevant. Generally, use plain language. Uh, you don't have to talk in any particular way or uh, use artist speak. That can actually be really inaccessible for a jury to, to clearly understand what you do, why you do it, and how you do it. Um, avoid jargon, or if you need to use something that maybe is a little bit jargony for your discipline, try to explain what it is. Um, don't make assumptions. The, the jury is going to be from all different backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives. So um, uh, just keep that in mind. Try to be authentic to yourself and the way you write. Do research. Use an outside eye. Chris, great advice on you know getting someone um, who's familiar with your practice to review, but also maybe someone who's not familiar with your practice to see if they can understand what you're trying to ask for in a grant. And start early. <laughs> taxes, oh, I can cut this part off, but you know, taxes are important to consider. Um, CADA does provide T4As for any grant amount over $500 a year. So you will get a T4A slip and that affects your taxes. So it's considered income. Um, but for the most part, you should be able to write off any project related expenses. Um, and the only part of the grant you should pay income tax on income tax on is your artist fee or, you know, subsistence if, if you've included that. So keep receipts, keep good track. Um, if you have questions, ask the CRA. You can reach out to us. We have resources, but the CRA is obviously, you know, the one I have to tell you to talk to, unfortunately. Um, okay, that's it. There's my contact info um, and I'll include it in the, the slides so you can look at it later. First question was, is there any suggestions regarding how how to account in the budget for items where the costs are changing, such as theater venues and flights. Hmm, good one. Who would like to field that one? You might I, each have different answers, to tell you the yeah. truth. I can start if you like, or Taylor, did you have your hand up? No, okay, <laughs> sorry. I didn't want to interrupt. Um, that's where you're going to have to be doing um, it's a educated best guess. Basically, you get quotes that you can for the for the cost of things at that time. There, it's normal to have project expenses fluctuate, especially as you say, these these can change. Cost of items can change, i.e., inflation these days. So yeah, it is a projected budget. It's not an actual budget. So that's okay. And you don't want to pad the budget artificially in the sense of um, contingency funds in a budget. You need to check with your funder first because with AFA, we don't accept contingency in a budget. It will be removed as ineligible. Some funders are okay with a contingency budget. So, you know, definitely have a note in your budget. I'm going to budget for four days. I made in three or four. So look at it as pragmatically as you can in terms of how you might normally plan for that kind of activity. Okay, sounds good. I can add a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I think we we allow contingency. We see it every now and then, but I would agree that like it 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 can't just be random. Like you want to really speak to what that might include. Like what kinds of contingency? What are you considering as costs that might come up? You know, unforeseen costs or things like that. And uh, there are some maybe some best practices for how to calculate that based on the project budget, like what percentage of a project budget for a theater production could be considered contingency, but always explain what it is and more detail, the better. And uh, I think 
I agree with Carrie, like if you can just do the best research you can for the expenses that you know you're going to be incurring, um, all you can do is, is project as best you can. And, you know, if it's flights and you see them fluctuating, pick the top end. Or if you know that it's more expensive to fly at a certain time of year based on something, then, then think about that. And when it comes to like venue rentals and things, um, it, it sort of ties into a bigger question of if you're applying for a grant that you know you need the grant money to do any of the project, like to even book a venue or to confirm people or any aspect of that, it should be taking place well enough after you know if you got the grant or not and you have the funds. If it's the type of project that you're going to do no matter what, and the grant is almost like a I don't know, not, not, not to call it a nice to have, but you know, you're going to do it no matter what, if you get the grant, it just helps cover those expenses. Then you might not be as worried about um, putting down a deposit for a venue before you know if you got the grant, because it's going to happen anyway, and you'll find other revenues to support that. So it's sort of a, a planning question and a timeline question, but also um, just do your best research. When you get a grant, there is usually the ability to shift things in your budget. So if something comes in at a lower cost, you can reallocate parts of your budget to something else. So if your flight costs less, maybe you bump up an artist fee or something, for example. Any big shifts in your budget, though, run it by your uh, by the organization. Yeah. Thanks so much, Taylor and Carrie. Uh, Vivian, what else have we got? Um, this was during Carrie's presentation. And the question was, what is the distinction between visual arts, new media category, and video film? Does it have anything to do with length? And where do short animations fall? That's a really great, great question because there are a bazillion areas of gray. Um, it's more about philosophically where you land and what your historical, the kind of the history behind your practice. You can have, be doing experimental video, experimental animation and identify as a media artist. Um, if you're coming from a complete film background and working within a history and aesthetic based on film, telling a story, documentary, narrative, doesn't matter, that would fit better in film and video. The most common thing that we'll kind of toss back at you when you're like, which one do I apply to? Is to think about who the jury or the expert panel is that is adjudicating your project. Do you want a film-based panel looking at it, which is made up of film, say, film directors, producers, industry people, um, so on and so forth, maybe script writers? Or do you want to have visual and media artists looking at your grant? Are they going to better understand um, kind of the genre and the area that you're coming from? And um, in your case, because I don't know a lot about your work, we could have further discussions one on one where I can learn more and then, then help you decide which category would be the best fit for you. Um, I'll pop in too again, just because there's always a, sometimes there's differences. So with CADA, all of our programs and our um, assessment committees are multidisciplinary. So you don't have to worry too much about like fitting into a particular um, discipline or you know, because uh, the grants are available to everyone. So you'll have a chance to describe your practice and you can select all the disciplines that you work in. So, you know, sometimes it's, if it's short animation work, then maybe that's a bit of new media and film. So you can select all the ones that apply to your practice. Cool, thanks very much. I find it really interesting that that um, with each of the organizations, if one of you doesn't cover a particular area, the other one usually does. It's uh, it's it's interesting. So you sort of cover all the bases between between you. So it's cool. Vivian, what else have we got? Um, this might have been touched upon a little bit, but uh, going over it again would be great. And this is the question: Are technology devices used for the proposed individual project, such as tablets and projectors, eligible? Which examples of devices are ineligible? Good one. Very good question. Who wants to tackle that one? I think you have different um, philosophies on that one too, <laughs> both of you nodding your heads, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we do. Um, for AFA, it's really, there is, I should acknowledge, even though I use computers, et cetera, as examples of capital items, for media arts, there are often gray areas. Things like um, external drives, art eligible as expendables because you need them to put your art on it. It can't exist without it. Um, there are artists, installation artists, for example, who are creating and then 
touring or exhibiting an installation that needs four identical projectors calibrated so that they are exact match. In that case, it can be justified as a project expense because those projectors have to stay with that installation in order for that art to exist. Um, projectors can also be capital if it's just bought to be used for every different art thing you do along the way. So you're gonna tour a film, but it's not specific to projectors. So there's gray areas. So um, a lot of them are hard nose for AFA. And then you get the media artists, of course, all us media artists, where the gray areas start to come into play. And again, reach out and say, hey, this is my context. What can I include as a non-capital equipment item? Yeah. Go. And for Kata, yes, um, for the programs I talked about today, and most of the individual collective ones, we do allow for some capital expenses or, you know, the purchase of equipment, um, but there is a maximum. So it's changed year over year. This year, we've actually increased it again. Um, so you can request up to $2,500 towards the purchase of equipment. Um, it has to still be very relevant and necessary for the project. Like it can't just be a random side request. It has to be related to the thing um, that you're doing. So whether it's a professional development activity or a project, um, you still have to make a strong case for why that um, equipment is relevant um, and needed. Of course, it's still going to have long-term impact and, and benefit. Um, but yeah, we just uh, were able to fund that. So we do because it's such an essential piece for artists to be able to, to make work quite often and sustain their practice. So we increased it to 2,500 just because of inflation. In past years, it's been two grand or a thousand. Sometimes it depends on the program. So always double check. Um, there's no cap for uh, renting. So if you need to rent a projector or rent um, lighting or rent a camera, you know, from CSIF or something, then there's no, there's no cap on that. But for the actual purchase of equipment, because it is considered a capital asset that lives beyond the length of the project, we do have limits to what we can support. That wouldn't include materials or supplies though. Okay, great. Thanks, both of you. Um, Vivian, I think there's at least one more in the chat. There's been a number that's been added right at the end, and I can go okay. through those as well. Cool. Um, the first one uh, is for AFA grants for musicians. If my project is recording an album, do I have to wait for the next cycle to ask for help marketing the album? Also, what is acceptable to include for marketing an, an album? For example, album release, merchandise, marketing plan. Uh, and that's the question. If I recall right, because I I'm, I don't do the music program, so I can speak more generalities than specifics. Um, Jason Flamia is the contact uh, for that there. Uh, but I can speak to, um, I believe for music, they do prefer that you break it out into a distinct phase. So your production, your creation phase, um, you probably want to apply to first, especially if you're doing... Um, um, professional mastering and, and produ producing the album. I know that gets quite expensive. So you could apply for that aspect of it. And then you can look at this as a broader strategy. So you get the grant, you produce the album, yay, you submit the report, we approve it. That means you can apply again now for the marketing aspect. So if you look at a longer game in terms of how to use or access potentially AFA funds, you can get more money over time. Um, for marketing, I know that we've allowed things like um, I believe some merch can count, um, I forget the formal name of it, people that go out and help get you radio play and, and exposure, um, costs related to Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all kinds of means um, that you can um, use a marketing grant, um, maybe publicist, but don't take my word on that. Um, I recommend you check the music guidelines on the AFA and reach out to Jason Flamia. He can help you with those specifics more accurately than I can. Okay, thanks. What's next? Um, another question. If an artist has been away from Alberta for a master's studies program, and this is specific for AFA, um, are they still considered an Alberta resident? Additionally, in the United States, you can do an optional practical training for 12 months to further one's career after studies and is still a component of a student visa. How does that impact someone's ability to apply for AFA upon returning to Alberta? Um, usually there's a few ways we can determine your residency. Um, for example, you may go away to study, but that does not mean necessarily that you're giving up your Canadian residency. 
in a particular province, especially if you're still filing taxes to the CRA. The address that is on your tax return is your legal residence in Canada. If that's an Alberta address, no problem. You just happen to be away studying for a couple of years, four years, that is fine. Um, if you actually were not paying taxes in the province and had no presence in any way in Canada, then you may have to be starting at that reset of one year prior to the next deadline is the minimum you need to be here. And again, for the details, reach out to me personally, we can discuss that with you and um, figure out where that lands. Okay, and there's another question regarding AFA grants. Um, are you also able to apply for curatorial projects through AFA? Can these fall under an individual project grant if an individual is organizing an exhibition as opposed to an organization? That is a great question. And the answer is yes, we do accept curatorial projects by individuals. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is if you are working with an organization or a gallery on your project, you're going to want to be very mindful that the expenses you apply for are only your expenses and that they're not being used as a backdoor way for that organization to access additional funds. Um, that can happen simply because people don't always know where those boundaries are with our grants. Um, so other than being aware of that kind of distinction, absolutely, we do get applications like that quite a bit. Um, and also for the AFA, I forgot to mention earlier, you can actually, because I saw a question related to this, you can only have one grant at a time with AFA and apply for one grant at a time at the AFA, regardless of the disciplines or how we split things out. Thank you. Okay, and this is another uh, budget question. Uh, when submitting budgets for a grant project, do monthly studio costs, for example, rent, utilities and travel uh, insurance be submitted with a project outline? Um, this one might be for both of us, but I can start. Um, so yes, with a project grant, uh, you would be able to include things like ongoing um, studio rent or utility costs. Like it could be your studio costs, or it could even be your home costs, depending on the context of the project and what you need support for. It would obviously only be for the duration um, of the project. So like, for example, if you were uh, planning to be in your studio uh, creating a new body of work over four months, you would be requesting those costs for rent, utilities, travel for those specific months and that period of time where you're actively working on the project. Um, I don't know if there's a second part. Uh, and insurance too, yeah. So as long as it's relevant project costs, that's usually uh, A-OK -okay with CADA. For a professional development grant, like the micro grant I was talking about, you can also still request subsistence support or those kinds of things if they're necessary to access and undertake that that learning opportunity or that um, activity. Okay, Carrie, can you address that? Yep. Um, for the AFA, yes, as well. Um, your studio costs um, can include insurance. It has to be prorated, or for example, only include the number of months for your project. So if you pay an annual rate for insurance, <laughs> um, but you're only got a six month project, you need to then calculate what the six month worth is of that insurance. Again, because we only covered the duration of the project and much the same as what Taylor said for the other stuff too. Okay, thank you. I need to mention something before we go on. It's almost nine o'clock now. So we're not gonna be able to get all of the questions in, I'm afraid, sorry about that. Um, hmm. I know we're we're gonna have to shut down the the um, the event so we can stop the recording uh, fairly soon. So um, maybe we have time for one more. Okay, the next one on the list is when you say add as much detail as possible to budget notes. What does that typically look like? If notes are extremely detailed and take up a lot of space, is that better? Or should it be condensed as much as possible? Thanks, Alex. That's a good question. Um, and I know I'm the one who probably said, be as detailed as possible. <laughs> um, I should get more clear with my words. I would say you wanna be specific and clear, but not you don't have to be granular. So um, I think with every budget line item, it's helpful to think about, is it clear what it is for? 
uh, if it involves a person, like if it's artist fees or an honorarium or elder fee, like who, who is that for? Um, if you're renting something, say where you're renting it from. So if it's equipment, is it from Long and McQuaid? Is it from uh, a media? So where are you getting? So the kind of like the do a little who, what, when, where, and then and then to think about um, where did you get that number? So this is a quote from this graphic designer who uh, I reached out to. There's a support document included that outlines their rate to do this amount of work. So it just kind of justifies how you got to that number. Maybe it's a breakdown. So if you're asking for subsistence, the budget notes should say subsistence includes food, utilities, childcare, whatever, for four months, have the monthly rate and the total amount. And uh, you know that narrative of, of your budget should match your timeline, should match your whole application. So no surprises in your budget. It should really align with everything else in your application. But I think if just if you were an assessor and you were reading a budget, is it clear what it's for, how they got to that number, um, those kinds of things. So happy to look over a, a, a draft budget, too, if anyone wants to know, is this too much detail or not enough? Um, you don't want to overwhelm, you know, like don't be including like links to things in the budget. I would save those for support material. Just try to be concise. Yeah, good question. Agreed. What she said. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well said. Okay. Uh, like I said, I'm really sorry we couldn't get to more of the questions. Um, I read through some of them. There are some really good ones. It's unfortunate. But um, Carrie and Taylor have both indicated that you can reach out to them. And um, these are obviously questions that could be relevant to other people, but definitely for the person who's asking, it's probably is helping you decide either if you're going to apply for grant or not, and also to help you sort of flesh that out. Anyway, um, so anyway, thank you so much, the three of you for, for coming in and delivering your words of, of wisdom and support again. And uh, thank you everybody for being here tonight. It was a, it was a great event. And uh, if you can be here next Wednesday to hear Michael Peterson talk from Canada Council, we would welcome you with open arms. So have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.